Well, all right. Welcome, everyone. Appreciate you joining us for our conversation today. We're going to be focusing on the financial aid piece of the law school consideration process. Obviously, like for most people, this is the can be the most influential piece of the where am I going part of the decision making process um, because law school is expensive. But fortunately, there are resources available, not just from scholarships from schools, student loans, outside scholarships. So we're going to discuss all of those options today and what how you should consider um, this piece of information when you're making that final decision of where you want to go to law school. So I'm joined here today by two awesome experts. So I'll let them introduce themselves um, on the financial aid piece, especially. So I'll start with Kristen. Please let us know your position, where you uh, where you're working currently, um, and how long you've been in admission. Great. Thank you so much. And hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kristen Mercado. I am the Assistant Dean for Admission and Financial Aid at UC Davis School of Law in Davis, California, part of the UC system. Um, also, maybe sometimes known as King Hall. I couldn't see our, whoops, wrong hand. Uh, you can see our, our name of our building and our building behind me. Um, I have been in law school admissions for 13 years total, 12, almost all of them at Davis and the last 10 as the Dean of Admissions and financial aid at UC Davis. Um, and I'm really happy to talk about this topic because I will admit to ha having pretty much zero knowledge when I started the process of um, figuring out how I was going to finance law school. And I think I definitely would have benefited from a little bit better education going into it. So good good on you for joining and logging in to learn a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Jorge? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Jorge Garcia. I am Assistant Dean of Admissions, Financial Aid, and Campus Diversity at California Western School of Law. Uh, I've been in uh, law school admissions slash financial aid for over 20 years. Uh, prior to my uh, law school career, I was a financial aid, uh, started as a financial aid counselor uh, at UC San Diego, and I did that for, for 10, about 10 years. So I've been uh, in this uh, space for, you know, 30 plus years um, uh, delivering uh, financial aid to to students, both undergrad and graduate students. Nice. And I should have started with this, but I, I'm just in a habit because I've known you all for five years that I've been in admissions now. Do you all prefer being referred to as your title or is first name okay? <laughs> I'm good with either one. Okay, so first right. name is fine if sure. it comes out naturally. Yeah. I tell students, prospective students, to you all, it's Dean Mercado and Dean Garcia. But for me, I just want to make sure um, that I'm not offending anyone. Um, I agree with Kristen. I, I'm, I'm... <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. It's just a habit for me now that we know each other. Um, but no, thank you for that. Um, so the first question, of course, you know, when we're starting, when you look at law school, especially if you're someone like me, when I, you know, I was a first year college student, I was fortunate to graduate with zero debt from undergrad. And so I didn't have to take out loans. And so now you're entering the law school world. You see these tuition numbers and you're like, I'm probably going to need some type of loan help or some type of funding, you know, trying to figure out how am I going to pay for this? I think is obviously the first hurdle. For you, uh, how do you recommend that students look at this or like what options are they looking at when it comes to how much is law school really? Because obviously you're not just paying tuition, you're also paying cost of living now for the most part. Um, and how do you advise students on how they should expect to fund law school, especially now that you're more likely than not going to be doing it on your own and you're not going to necessarily be relying as much or if at all uh, on a parent, legal guardian or family like you may have done when you were an undergrad. So how do you all advise that? I'll let Christian start. <laughs> okay. Well, one of the things I always like to start the conversation whenever we're talking about financing law school is just with a kind of a basic premise, which is this, that a legal education is a law, lifelong investment in yourself, your brain, right? Um, no one gets to take it away from you. It's not like a car or a home, right? It's a, it's an invest, it's a unique kind of investment. And so I think as you go into this process, it can be helpful, um, especially when you're getting into the dollars, um, which can be a bit daunting. And maybe the first time you're thinking about something, an investment of this size, to really think of it as an investment and not necessarily all as an expense. Um, there are definitely expenses associated with being a professional school student, but think of it, you know, really as like you're putting a, a, an investment in yourself, your future, your family's future, all the things that go along with that. Um, so that being said, 
you know, as you kind of think about what are the pieces that go into, you know, what you're looking at for that investment, right? Um, one of the things I think is helpful is to just understand this phrase that you will hear called the cost of attendance. Um, and the cost of attendance is um, more than just tuition, right? So it it kind of determines what the what the school says is um, the average student what it's going to cost them. You know, it's going to be required the, of the investment between tuition, which is obviously the fixed a fixed number, right? You can't negotiate your tuition on an individual basis. It's a set a set number. Um, and then it's also going to include your living expenses. So um, uh, it's going to be based on the academic year. So not including your summers. Um, and one other thing that I kind of think is super important to, to think about is that law schools, by and large, unless it's like a part-time program, um, if it's a full-time program, they are going to be assuming that you are generally assuming that you are not working while you're a student, which may be very different from what you experienced in undergrad. I know it was for me, I worked like 30 hours a week in undergrad. And then suddenly I was like, oh, I'm not going to work. And that seemed like a ridiculous idea. How, why wouldn't I work? Um, and there's actually a rationale for it. Um, it's based on experience and the idea that really professional school is very different than undergrad and kind of being a law student is your full-time job. So uh, because of that, you have the ability to kind of borrow for all of your expenses, your tuition plus your living expenses. And it's not an assumed that you'll work or that you'll have outside funding sources. Um, it's really assumed that you are going to bear um, the, the sort of the expense, right, yourself, you fund it through different sources, but that it's going to come from you rather than from, you know, you and your parents or you and some outside sources of income. Um, so it's a, it's a very different kind of model than you might be used to from undergrad, or if you've gone to graduate school, then you might have seen in, in other graduate school. Um, and it's something that, you know, you kind of have to kind of orient to this new world of like thinking of it as like the first day of law school is like the first day of your legal career. So you're not going to have another job doing something else. Your job is to be a law student and then eventually it'll be to be a lawyer. So um, one of the things that I think is always good is to just throw out some average numbers too. Um, let's let's know what we're talking about here. Um, so right now, I mean, there's, you'll hear different, there's sort of a range of numbers, but the average, the current average annual cost of attendance is about $75,000 a year. That can be more or less depending on, you know, where in the country it is, your living expenses may be different. Um, but the vast majority of that, about $50,000 of that 75 per year is going to be tuition. So tuition is definitely going to be the biggest component of this. And you should expect to live like, a, as my dad told me when I was a law student, a poor, poor student. Um, that budget is going to assume a very frugal lifestyle and you should live according to that frugal lifestyle. So when you're talking about three years of law school, which is what most full-time programs are, um, you know, the average three-year financial investment that you're putting out, you're putting out there is, you know, about $220,000. Now it doesn't all have to come from your pocket, which is good. So don't be scared by that number, but I do think we should just put it out there, right? Let's so you have a sense of what the ballpark is. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the universe that we're starting out with, and then we'll move on to kind of talk about how you tackle that large number. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that what she said is, is spot on. I, uh, the one thing that I would recommend people do is to, when you're looking at law schools to, to apply to, um, and, and I'm sure both of you have experienced this, people will ask, well, what's your tuition? And I think at that point, you know, that stage in, in, in the research, it's too early to be worrying or selecting schools where you're going to apply based on the, the, the tuition cost, because there will be, as, as, as it was mentioned, you know, that there are funding sources, some of which are scholarships that will, that will control for that initial cost, the tuition. So, you know, it could be that you apply to a school where tuition is $60,000 alone and, you may get a full tuition scholarship at which point you know at least that aspect of the cost is zero uh, so i think that you know while it is some factor that will need to be addressed early on it's just not a, a way to be selecting schools just yet you know look for the schools that interest you for the programs that attract you locations that where you want to be for three years and possibly your career and then sort of then apply. And once you start getting your offers, you can start determining, okay, well, which one's gonna have me incur more debt than the, this other one. And that can be one of the num number of factors that, that you select schools with. Yeah, no, definitely. I think you were talking about that, you know, the, the upfront cost of tuition can definitely, I know when I was like, you know, I was like, I, I don't know if I can, 
afford all that. But no, there's definitely a variety of funding sources. And Jorge, you kind of alluded to that. Can you can you all talk about what are those funding sources, generally speaking, um, that students can use, whether it's coming from the school or outside the school, to help pay for these costs? Uh, sure. Well, I, I can start. Uh, you know, the, as uh, I think that the funding source that everybody is really interested in is the scholarships, right? That's that is practically free money. It's it's a reduction on your tuition uh, that you know allows you to make the education more affordable. That is probably the one fixed cost within the cost of attendance that you can't really control for or you have very little control uh, over. Um, so scholarships are generally, at least as a, as a 1L student, when you're applying to law school, uh, the strength of the application will generally dictate, you know, how much this uh, scholarship is gonna be based on how bad does this school really want you. Uh, for better or worse, uh, the academic indicators tend to be a, a, a one of the larger factors, but there are schools uh, that will, that will account for other uh, uh, non-quantitative factors. You know, your background, uh, are you first gen? Uh, what kind of, uh, you know, what does your resume look like? How good was your personal statement? So they will base uh, uh, awards uh, on, on the overall application. There will be some schools and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the UC system does have need-based aid, which they call grants. Uh, so that's definitely something that could com complement, you know, an academic scholarship. And then, so that's, as, 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 when, you know, when you're coming into to the program, that, that's what you're hoping for. That's what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, once you become a second and third year student, there may be some merit-based scholarships or scholarships that are based on your involvement within the program, you know, if you take student leadership positions. So that, you know, scholarships are, are, are the one type of aid that you don't have to pay back. It's, it's, it's just a reduction in the cost. Um, the, the largest share of the aid package uh, is gonna fall on the student loans. Um, most of us in, 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 my, you know, in, in, in my roles uh, recommend that you stay with federal student loans. Uh, federal direct loan is a program. Uh, it, it, they come in two, two versions. There's one that is called the unsubsidized loan which um, has a limit, an annual limit of $20,500. Um, and then the remainder of the uh, need, you know, after you, you take the uh, cost of attendance minus any scholarship, minus a, an unsubsidized loan, that remainder then becomes graduate plus eligibility, which is the second type of loan. The difference between those two loans, there's there's two major differences. One is that the Graduate Plus tends to be about 1% more expensive in terms of interest. And then they have an origi origination fee that is about three percentage points higher. The uh, other major difference is that the unsubsidized loan does not uh, require a credit check, whereas the Graduate Plus does. And by credit check, I mean, they basically look for adverse uh, credit history. So if you're pay late on your payments, if you're, you know, you, you have people calling you at odd hours uh, trying to collect from you, th that can become a problem and that could keep you from, from accessing that student loan. Um, you know, in my experience, the vast majority of students don't have, don't come across that obstacle, uh, but it is based on a, a credit check. Uh, and, you know, when you when you look at the whole package, the hope is that you have some scholarship money and then there'll be the unsubsidized loan and then the back end will be a graduate plus. And I will stop there on if uh, uh, Kristen has additional. Yeah, so uh, just a couple other, you know, possible sources that I think are worth mentioning, which is um, outside scholarships. Um, so what's nice about outside scholarships is they're like the scholarships you get from law schools and that you don't, it's free money, right? We love the free money. Free money is good. All free money. We love that. That's awesome. The other thing that's great about them is they don't care where you go to law school. For the most part, they're not tied to a particular school or region. So if you get one of those, you know, you have that money follows you wherever. So it's sort of like a, a almost as though you have that money in hand, right? Um, you know that if you, you can kind of take, a, gives you a little more freedom in where you decide to choose 
um, to attend law school. So maybe it allows you to go to that school that was like your reach school, but gave you a little less scholarship money if you pick up an outside scholarship that now makes it financially feasible. Um, the other thing I will say is that uh, outside scholarships, there are a lot more of them for current law students than for incoming law students. So don't be sort of discouraged if you don't get one as an incoming student, like don't write off that source. One of the biggest mistakes that I think I made was I sort of thought when I started law school, the package I had was like the package I was going to have for all three years. And I didn't apply for outside scholarships while I was a student or just look for other ways to reduce my indebtedness over time. Um, and there's there's actually ways to do it that are not insignificant. Um, and the thing about any amount you can reduce in your loans over your three years of borrowing is good because um, if you if you borrowed an undergrad and you had subsidized Stafford loans, what that unsubsidized subsidized language means is that while you were an undergrad, the federal government didn't charge you interest while you were in school. You only started accruing interest once you graduated. So the fun thing is now you're a grown up. <laughs> the federal government says now you're a grown up. You have a unsubsidized Stafford loan, which means that you are accruing interest from the second the money goes into your account, right? Um, and it just like it grows over time, right? Same thing with Grad Plus, um, which means that you know you are accruing interest on two different loans at again, as Jorge mentioned, seven percent for at seven percent for um, subsidized Stafford and about eight percent for Grad Plus. So even if you were to get an outside scholarship that's like a thousand dollars, that's a thousand dollars less you borrow. That a thousand dollars stop, you know, is not accruing interest while you're in school. And then as you're repaying over ten years or maybe more, you do like a longer repayment plan. Um, it, it it adds up is is the point. Um, so I think it's something to really kind of think about. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that there are private loans, as Sarah mentioned, generally you'll hear admissions often, admissions and financial aid offices recommend that you go with the federal student loans. Um, and that's big for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the largest is that, as you may have heard, um, there are all kinds of federal programs to help you repay at a, an affordable rate. And if you go into public sector work, you can get some of those federal loans forgiven a certain number of years after you graduate if you continue to work in those public sectors. So, uh, but if, for example, let's say you can you can't qualify for a grad plus, maybe you had some bad financial history and that's not something you can get, and so you need to borrow a private loan. Just know that those are out there. Um, generally, they don't have as favorable repayment terms, and the interest. Uh, rates may not be fixed. So it may be great when you first take it out and then less great down the line. Um, so it's just, it, but know that there is kind of a backup option. Um, same thing if you are not eligible for federal student loans. If you're, for example, you're an international student or you're an undocumented student, that private loans um, in, in those cases become your, your only option because federal loans won't be available to you. So there are kind of a wide range, but as I mentioned, most of, most folks are going to be financing law school through, um, scholarships, grants, so law school aid, um, and then federal student loans. That's what I did. Mostly federal student loans, to be honest. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 there, are, there is support. The point is you don't have to come up with this money out of your pocket, which is hopefully good news if you were starting to fear that that might be the case or if that was your um, concern to know that you can do it, right? There's a way to, to do this um, with support of different types. So, yeah. And, and you know, uh, it, when, when Kristen mentioned uh, that she assumed that her 1L package was going to be the same throughout the three years, it, it, it's something came up on, you know, I started thinking about uh, the fact that as a 2L or 3L student, you may end up getting, or the hope is that you, you start doing internships, right? And, and some of those internships are going to be paid. And I think that while it's not considered part of the financial aid package, it is a revenue source or a revenue stream that you're going to start getting. And, you know, the, the hope is, or, you know, uh, the best way to, the, the, to treat that is that for every dollar that you now have coming in as uh, an intern, you reduce a dollar in the debt. And that's how you start controlling for the student debt. Uh, you know, I, I've known students who, who get internships that pay 25, 30, $40 an hour. Uh, and over a week, you know, putting in 15, 20 hours, 
it, it again, it, it adds up, right? It's just that much more uh, loan that you now don't have to um, borrow. And and the right way of, of treating it is not like extra money, it's replacement money. And that way you will minimize and contain the amount of debt that, that you end up with. And yeah, I mean, you know, the other, the other uh, uh, aid, uh, uh, that, that you could look into is that many schools have what's called a loan repayment assistance program, an LRAP program, that if you go into a public uh, service, uh, whether it be a nonprofit, some or some schools will, will treat government jobs as uh, will qualify. Um, after you graduate and you begin practice in a uh, public service sector, you know, they, some schools have benefits on the back end. They will help you make those payments uh, once you are an attorney and therefore, you know, the, the burden is not only on you, you know, they, they, it becomes a scholarship on the back end, contingent on you continuing to work in a nonprofit or a government agency. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and you all talked about a little bit, the you know, the, some of the differences between federal loans and private loans. Can you go a little bit more in depth into like, what's that main distinction between of private loans and federal loans and why, you know, typically we advise students that they want to limit how much they go into private loans and especially for those students that don't necessarily have that option of federal student loans and can only rely on private student loans. What what are those differences between those? Uh, well, go ahead, go ahead. You can uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> take the lead. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I touched on some of them, but the, the things to think about is, um, so one of the things that sometimes they'll do, although I will have to say they are trying to be, I think they are getting a little bit better. So um, in terms of, sometimes they used to have some practices that I found a little bit um, deceptive, I guess, maybe. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, they're really trying to serve a market of students who can't access the federal loans and trying to offer something that's as close to comparable. So, um, but so, for example, one of the things, one of the big things is that they may have a lower interest rate, um, you know, while you're in school or it, it early in the life of the loan, but then it varies after a certain number, a certain amount of time. So if like, for example, your loan switched to variable at this time, right, interest rates are high at this in this current economy. So that would be a bad time to have a variable loan because your interest rate might unexpectedly shoot up from what you had early on. And, you know, one or 2% makes a big difference when you're borrowing tens of thousands of dollars over three years. Um, the other thing is they, although they're not as strict with the credit requirements as say like a credit card or a home mortgage, um, they're gonna be more strict than the federal student loans. The federal student loans really are just like, um, you know, the grad plus, it's really just like you don't have, you know, things like bankruptcy or, you know, outstanding bad debt, right? Um, these are going to be looking for a little bit, you know, you don't have to have like 700 credit, but, you know, credit score, but you do need to have, you know, a little bit, a little bit more stable um, um, credit history, or you have to have, you know, like co-signers, things like that. Um, one of the biggest reasons that I don't like them is because sometimes you may have to make payments. Um, either while you're in school or immediately after you graduate. Federal student loans have these things called grace periods. So after you graduate, you get six months to kind of get your feet under you. This is really important for people graduating from law school because you take the bar exam um, within about two months of graduation. And most people you know, are not working or doing other things because that's not really conducive to being successful on the bar exam. Um, so if you don't have a grace period and you have to start repaying right away, gosh, that's that's pretty stressful. And your job may not start until you, have, you know your bar results. There's kind of a lot of things that are problematic with that. Um, but one of the biggest ones, one of the biggest reasons why I encourage people to shy away from private loans, especially if you're thinking about doing public sector work, is that they don't have um, forgiveness programs. Um, and um, that's like, you know, you're walking away from essentially, as I said, like a scholarship after you graduate. So, you know, why repay your loans if your school and the federal government are going to help you do it, right? So that you don't actually have to repay it. Um, it's an awesome thing. I qualified for federal forgiveness um, for the last little bit of my loans that I was still carrying. And it was great. It was fantastic. Um, I was so gleeful when I got the notification. So um, you, you don't want to sort of take yourself out of the running for that kind of um, support. Um, so it's just something to think about. But again, if you don't have the option of federal student loans, 
know that there are some lenders that really have developed loan programs, private student loan programs specifically for like professional school, school students, graduate students. And they've really tried to mirror as close as possible um, the federal programs and make them, um, I think, much more fair, um, if not quite as favorable um, as the federal programs, at least you know when it comes to like the interest rates are usually not as favorable. Um, yeah, and, and she did a great job. Uh, Kristen did a great job in differentiating the, the the federal versus the private. Now, within the unsubsidized and the subsidized, if you want to really like get in the weeds and get technical about it, you know, every year, every July first, they determine the interest rate for that following year, and then whatever that interest rate lands for that year, that will be the interest rate for the life of the loan. Okay, but it's possible that as a law student, you could end up with three loans with three different interest rates, and it's all based on a T-bill, 91-day T-bill, plus a spread that they add to that. Uh, so if interest rates go up, which they have been the last uh, year and a half, then interest rate, you know, your, your loan for that following year will be a little higher. If they drop, then the interest rate goes down. So, you know, if we were having this conversation four years ago, you know, unsubsidized loans were probably closer to three or 4% with graduate plus being one point above that. You know, now that we interest rates have gone up and you probably heard that mortgage rates have gone up, everything has gone up, then that's why the interest rates are increasing. But, uh, you know, Kristen is right. You know, when you look at the long-term life of these loans, you know exactly what your payments are going to be. Right, because they're fixed. Whereas in a private loan, they they fluctuate based on. Uh, they also base it on, on on interest rates, but but they don't have a cap. They can keep going up, and it can turn into like a double digit interest rate if you're not careful. Um, and that's where they really make their money. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I'm learning too for that specific <laughs> on how that, and that makes sense now because I think it, two of my student loans have different interest rates in the first one, and so. Um, yeah, public service loan forgiveness is a great thing. I got four more years left. Um, so I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, talking a little bit more, going back to scholarships um, and the distinctions, you know, schools vary differently when it comes to the merit-based or need-based portion of scholarships and the conditions that schools, some schools may have, other schools don't have conditions at all. So can you, um, Kristen, I'll start with you and talk a little bit about the, the those distinctions and those differences between schools? Yeah, so this is really important, although I will say there's kind of less variation than even like five, six years ago in terms of kind of what, how people are structuring their scholarships, I would say. So um, one of the things that, um, you know, I don't know if it's, I can't remember if it's being covered in another video, but if not, the 509 report is this thing that every law school has to have on their home, a link to on their homepage. The 509 report has a section that talks about conditional scholarships. And so I always think that's a good place just to take a quick peek and make sure you know if this is a school that has a conditional scholarship. It may be a very, um, what's the right word? A very reasonable condition. <laughs> like it might not be an owner's condition, but it's a condition. And that's a great way to know right off the bat before you read through the letter or anything um, that whether or not that's a school that, that does conditional scholarships because the ABA requires us to sort of report if that's our practice. So what does it mean to have a conditional scholarship? So um, for example, you may get a scholarship that says, congratulations, you've been awarded a you know $90,000 scholarship, $30,000 each year, um, and you're awesome and amazing. And it's for this really old person who you know went to the law school you know, 50 years ago and left in the state, if, you know, it may have all this language. And then at the bottom, it says, um, and the scholarship will renew each, you know, $30,000 each year, as long as you remain in the top 15% of the class. That's a condition. <laughs> um, and the reason why it's important to be aware of what the conditions are on any scholarship you get. Um, so the biggest, so the, I would say the most common conditions that you get are um, there's, sort of, there's sort of three that I see commonly. Good standing, which means you just can't go on academic probation. Doesn't mean you have to be at anywhere other than one, you know, 0.01 away from being on the academic probation list. Um, that's the most common one. That's what we use at our school. It's what a lot of schools use. But then you might see something that has like a specific GPA. They may say you need to have, you know, a 3.3 or whatever, uh, what, whatever number they decide. Um, or they may say, 
you need to be in the top third of the cost, let's say at the end of your first year. Um, so, okay, you may look at that GPA or that class rank and be like, well, I did great in undergrad, of course I'll be fine. But the first year of law school, um, almost all of your classes are going to be on a curve. If you were a social science major, um, you know, uh, anything where basically anything's in first STEM, you may not have experienced the curve um, in grading and that it can be um, kind of a rude awakening sometimes for people when it comes to those first set of law school grades. So it's really important to understand how the conditional GPA, what, what that GPA and that class rank requirement is translates to that school's curve. Every school, every school has a slightly different curve. So you need to understand maybe the, cur the, the condition is that you have, that the GPA that they're giving you is, you know, uh, set at the median, right? So the midpoint in the, in the curve. Okay. That may not be too daunting, but also realize that means half the class is going to have a GPA below that. Um, and the curve sort of forces everyone onto this range of grades, right? No matter how great your answer is, if someone else's is infinitesimally greater, you know, you fall down because that's the way the grading curve works. You need to understand how the conditions on the scholarship translate to the grading at that school and be really realistic with yourself. Everyone expects to be at the top of their class when they come into law school. Um, and not everyone can be, it's just mathematically impossible. So if your money is going to be contingent on you performing at a certain level, you should know that. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't take it. It just means you need to be super aware because that is gonna be a significant, you know, could be a significant stressor for you. Um, sometimes people need time to get the hang of law school. I was one of those people. I did not get good grades my first year. Took me a while to get a hang of law school exams, how to study, all of it. So um, if I had a scholarship that was contingent on a class rank, I would have been in trouble. Um, other things to think about, um, sometimes if you're applying to public schools, public schools, for example, I'm at a public school, um, your scholarship amount could change based on whether or not you become a resident and thus qualify for lower resident tuition if you come in as, say, like a non-resident. So you should just know, does it change based on residency? Am I required to try to establish residency or does the school not care? Um, understand that. Um, the other thing, which also used to be more common, but is a little less common these days, is that sometimes schools will front load a scholarship. So in other words, the scholarship is, let's say, again, you know, maybe it's a great scholarship, it's $90,000 over three years. But in the first year, you get $40,000. And then you get 25 your second, 25 your third. It, you're still getting the same amount over three years, but you should just understand that, you know, the loan indebtedness you have at the first year is not going to be the same in years two and three, unless you get, you know, a great intern, paid internship or, you know, you find some other source of income, an outside scholarship, um, you know, you're going to borrow more in years two and three. So you just need to understand that not every year of law school may look the same and you need to understand the school has to tell you exactly what the conditions are. Um, but you need to read them and understand them. And if you read them and you're like, I don't really understand 100%, I'm not sure I totally get it. Don't just kind of say like, oh, that's okay, I'll figure it out. Ask questions, like ask questions, ask them to break it out for you year by year. Exactly like tell them, hey, show me what I'm going to have to borrow this year and this year and this year, like really break it down for you so that you understand what your obligations are, what you should expect each year. Um, that's super, super important to ask as many questions as you need to, to understand. Because although we may think we've made it crystal clear, we're not in your shoes, right? So um, it may not be as clear <laughs> as we as we hope uh, hope it is in the scholarship letter. Um, and I don't know, Horace, do we wanna talk a little bit about need-based gift aid and work study and kind of those pieces? Sure. Uh, I, I just want to add a couple of pieces to what oh, you yeah, said. Yeah, to <laughs> reemphasize what she said. Uh, and, and that means that, you know, well, when you are given a scholarship with a condition of a GPA, that and you have another school that gives you something similar, you, you need to understand what that GPA really means, you know, because there may be some curves that are a little softer than others. So you could potentially have a, a scholarship that says, okay, you need to maintain a 3.0. Okay, well, in some places, a 3.0 means that maybe only 20% of the people get a 3.0. The next school could mean half of the people get a 3.0, right? So uh, you, you need to understand what that GPA truly means 
uh, even though the numbers are the same, it can mean that many more people get that 3.0 at one school versus the other. And that's something that you you definitely want to look into. Uh, and needless to say, when, when some scholarships say you need to be in a percentage, top percentage, top third of the class, and the other one has a GPA condition. Okay, well, what's that, what does that top third GPA really mean? You know, where do people usually land as far as GPA when they're in the top third? So then you can compare apples to apples. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that would be the the, the one thing that, and, and as Kristen said, ask questions, right? If if they're evasive, then that's, you know, that's something <laughs> I, I would hope that's not the case. But, you know, if you're not trying, if you're not getting the answers you, you, you need, you know, then that's something that you definitely want to consider. Um, with regard to uh, work study, and, and it's something that we haven't really discussed, uh, which is a federal program. And what it allows you to do is to earn a portion of your aid versus borrowing a portion of the aid. Most awards, uh, you know, they're in the range from five to eight, nine thousand dollars a year. And you know, some schools will use um, work study funds to hire students to help out around this law school. For example, in my office, in the admissions office, I will generally hire two or three students to be my student uh, tour guides, my ambassadors. And they get paid out of this fund, which means that at the end of the year, they didn't have to borrow an extra $5,000, which when you compound the interest could end up being $10,000, right? When it's all said and done. You know, there are some faculty who in the second and third year will be looking for research assistance. And they will look for students who have work study to um, basically to them, it would be a free uh, you know, employee, right? It, it, it's, it's students who are working for them, but they're not paying them out of their own faculty budget. They're being paid out of work study. So um, the first year is generally you're not encouraged to, to work. And you know, that's that's another whole session, I'm sure, on, on when you should work and when you shouldn't work. Uh, but you know, definitely in years two and three. Uh, in addition to internships outside of the law school, there's the ability to work inside of the law school. You know, the library, most uh, law school libraries are generally um, uh, run by student workers. You know, they're the ones that are at the front uh, desk and, and uh, you know, they, they will, they will uh, the library will use a lot of the uh, work study students to help run those laws, uh, those libraries. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's earnings. It's you know it, you're going to be paid either biweekly or monthly, depending on how the um, the law school operates, and you're just not having to borrow it. You're earning it. Uh, if you're doing a research uh, research assistant position, I mean that could even be an entry into your legal resume that you did research for so and so who just wrote this amazing book, and you were part of that. So it it does have additional value. Um, and, you know, while it is considered you're going to be receiving a W-2 form at the end of the year that says you earn so much, as a law student, you're generally not working. So uh, most of the time, you're, you're really not having to pay any taxes on that. It's just, you know, it's your ability to not have to borrow it. Yeah, I remember from my bar interview, they asked me, they're like, you haven't done your taxes in three years. Why not? I was like, I wasn't making any, I don't have any money. <laughs> I was like, going, I was losing money because I was going in debt, so I did. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, definitely. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, talking about outside scholar or other forms of scholarships as well. You know, I know there are some schools that offer scholarships to certain populations. Um, uh, can Kristen, can you talk about a little bit of like what types of, generally speaking, the most common type of like if you're I don't know veteran or first gen, whatever that may be, types of scholarships that may exist. Yeah, so um, this is um, definitely something that we've seen in the past few years, definitely an uptick in the number of these kind of scholarships that are targeted towards like specific populations of students. Um, and so uh, one of the things that some of those, some schools will consider you for those as part of the normal, you know, admitted student um, scholarship evaluation process, but some schools there is a separate application. So you want to make sure that every school where you're applying, you look through and know what whether they have any scholarships that require a separate application, have a different deadline, anything like that. It, it's usually not an onerous application. <laughs> um, for example, we have a public interest scholarship that has a separate application, but it's just a short statement that you write in a form. So, you know, it's not going to take you a lot of time to do it. Um, 
But if you don't do it, you take yourself out of the running for additional money because only the people that apply are considered for it. Um, there's there's definitely scholarships that kind of target, um, there's a lot of schools that have tried to kind of increase the support um, through scholarships for people who are first, you know, first generation college graduates, um, students who come from low income backgrounds, um, you know, students who, um, there are some schools that, that have um, scholarships um, specifically for like undocumented students or international students who, who have need. Um, those are, um, you know, may, again, may or may not have separate applications, but you should definitely, if you fall into one of these populations, you know, spend some time looking to see what the opportunities are. Um, and then I like to always kind of recommend there's um, an organization called Access Lex. They have a really, um, actually a really good scholarship data bank. Um, it's accessible to everyone. Um, they have a whole lot of other financial literacy tools on there. Um, and resources. So I recommend the site in general, but their scholarship data bank is actually quite good. And you can kind of filter for, you know, your profile, right? And find some of those outside scholarships. Um, I think they're really, you know, can be, um, can be really beneficial. Some of them are for, you know, from the schools themselves, some of them are from third party organizations. Those are good things to, to kind of know about. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, um, the other group that um, kind of has some uh, additional avenues for support um, when it comes to funding law schools. If you are a veteran of the armed services or you are, at least in California, if you're a dependent of someone who served. Um, so in California um, and maybe in other states, I actually confess, I don't know for sure, but um, there are specific state programs that um, provide um, essentially what are like tuition waivers <laughs> for the public law schools. And you can use them at, you know, at the law school level, at the law school and graduate school level. So we have some students who are, you know, their, their fan, one of their parents served in the armed services. They're able to attend a UC or a CSU. Um, and in this case, you know, UC law school, right? Um, tuition free, which is pretty awesome. Um, there are also federal programs, so post 9-11, you know, GI Bill, lots of um, those types of things. There are also maybe other like state programs um, that, you know, it's worthwhile reaching out to your, so if you are a veteran, like contact the VA, find out what the veterans affairs, you know, programs are, let them know the states that you're thinking about applying. So for example, in California, um, like you can get resident tuition, um, even if you're not a California resident, if you're exiting the armed services. So that's a pretty, that's a 12 grand um, savings right there. So there are a lot of things like that, that, um, you know, it's it's good to reach out to individual schools, but also sort of the entities, you know, like Veterans Affairs, reach out to them and find out what you qualify, um, you know, especially if you served, like, and you are entitled to those benefits, make sure you don't leave anything on the table that Uncle Sam owes you to, um, you know, have a new career after, after serving. Um, I also like to always kind of talk about a little bit sort of separately about um, international students um, and undocumented students and documented students. I know Jorge and Otue also have a special passion for this group, but um, you know, uh, Jorge and I are in California at California schools. So we have a pretty considerable population of students who are applying. Um, and it is, um, it's, it can be a little bit challenging. The good news is that there are more resources than you may think initially coming in. So although, um, you know, federal loans are not going to be an option for you and a lot of the private loans, there are some private loans that are um, specifically for international students and or for DACA students or other undocumented students. Um, there are three or four that um, companies now that have them. They are again, not as favorable as the federal loan programs, but they are not bad. And they do actually allow you to meet your cost of attendance. Like the caps on the borrowing are not so low that, um, you know, it essentially doesn't help you at all when it comes to law school. So the caps are now larger so that you can actually, you know, borrow to, to meet your cost of attendance. Um, the other thing to know is depending on the school, right? Um, you may also qualify for scholarships and even for need-based funds. Um, so here in California, we use the DREAM Act, um, the California DREAM Act, which is kind of like the FAFSA, but it's the state um, application. And we use that to assess need at the UCs and um, we award need-based grants on the basis of the information in there. Um, so that's 
you know, in addition to scholarships that for which you're, you know, absolutely eligible for. So there are a lot of things. There also are some outside scholarships that don't have citizenship requirements. And so Access Lex allows you to select for that, um, but also check with the school. I know that many of us try to keep a list of ones that we know of, like past students have re received, um, and, you know, that these organizations tend to, you know, kind of support um, our students. So um, the, the last thing I just want to say, especially to documented and undocumented students, um, and unfortunately, it looks like the number of documented students is going to rapidly decrease um, very soon. And so it will be mostly the students who are in the undocumented category without, you know, the ability to even work, right, um, to bring in some income, um, is to say that I know that it can be very scary and your experiences might not have always been positive self-identifying. Um, but I really, really encourage you, especially if you're admitted to a law school, to reach out to the Dean of Admissions or the head of financial aid and talk to them because um, chances are that, that you are not the first person to, in that situation to contact them. And if we know, if we can talk to you individually, we can make sure that we, you know, help you through the process, make sure that you don't miss out on any opportunities. And it's just, I always appreciate um, when students will share that information with me so that I can really make sure I help them through the process. Uh, Cause I know it's, I know it's like, it's really tough. And um, you know, we want you, we want you, we need you in law schools. Um, you have like a hugely invaluable perspective that is definitely needed. So um, I know it might be a little bit trepidatious sometimes to trust, but um, please definitely reach out to, to the offices and, um, you know, ask for help and make sure that, you know, you're, you know what you need to do for your situation to maximize the amount of support you receive and you know how to, how to, what things we can also help you through like the private loans. Um, you know, our director of financial aid does that all the time, helps people through the actual application and understanding the terms. So um, please reach out. I think it's super, super important. And I know Jorge has, he's like the um, master keeper of this amazing document that I will let him tell all of you about a great resource. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I saw uh, a few years ago, I saw a need to try and keep a list of scholarships or just uh, financial resources for students who were either undocumented uh, or were DACA recipients. So uh, I've taken it upon myself to, with the help of, of everybody, um, all my colleagues, to, to compile this list once a year. Um, I pass it, you know, once I, I put it together, I pass it out. Uh, you know, I generally pass it around the, the West Coast, the schools in the West Coast, but, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it, it has no copyright. It, it, it can be shared with anybody. Uh, so if anybody would like access to that, most of the schools do put them up in their um, either admissions or on their financial aid website. But uh, I believe I sent you this year's version, Kristen. Uh, I try to share it with the UCs and uh, again, with the West Coast uh, law schools. Um, uh, Josue, I don't know if you have it, I'll, I'll share it with you. And I share it with pre-law advisors. And, and again, it's uh, just a, a resource. Um, we go through it every year, clean out the ones that are no longer um, available, add any new ones. Uh, and, and I agree, uh, Access Lex has uh, an amazing search engine that helps you. I mean, basically it does the work for you. You fill out a, a, a profile, uh, this is who I am, this is what I'm interested in, and then it does the search for you. You know, it'll go in, and then anytime there's new scholarships that are added, if you happen to fit into them, they'll send you an email saying, okay, here's a new one. Um, and uh, going to the, you know, to those uh, privately funded scholarships that that uh, Kristen mentioned, uh, most law schools keep a website where they where, where they have those listed. And yes, some have uh, a, a separate application. Uh, they also may have a, schol a a page that keeps outside scholarships that they're aware of. So, for example, at my campus, if uh, the San Diego Bar Association or the uh, San Diego La Raza Lawyers has a scholarship coming up and they let us know, which they generally will notify the schools in the area, we just go and put it up there. And, and, and once you find that law school that you're going to go to, if they have a page like that, bookmark it. Right. And then just go back every three or four weeks and see what's new. And then if there's something that you're that fits, you know, your criteria, apply for it. Have a standing, you know, personal statement, basically addressing why you feel you are worthy of this scholarship and, and you would and the benefit that it would that, that comes with it. 
uh, and they just apply. You know, uh, a few years ago when I was at another law school, um, we admitted a, a, a student who came in without a scholarship. He was off the wait list, no scholarship. And he made it a point to, to every Sunday, he would go and do a search and he would submit three or four scholarship applications. And I'm sure he had to have submitted hundreds. By the time he graduated, well, by the time he finished that first year, he had $25,000 in scholarships that came from a thousand here, 1500 here and he just did it it was part of his of his process that that sunday afternoon he would just go through it and send out a bunch of them and you know if you don't do that th then you're missing out right because there are many scholarships that they just may not seem they're worth the the work and those are the ones nobody applies for and you know if you're the one that does regardless of whether you're very, very qualified or not, you're the one that applied and you stand a better chance. Everybody wants to apply for the $25,000, $30,000 scholarships. Nobody likes the ugly kid, right? The ones that are only like $2,000. Uh, so I would recommend that you make it a practice as much as possible to just go through those pages, uh, you know, what uh, Access Lex sends you and just submit applications. Again, don't, don't, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just have a standing uh, document that you can just keep submitting over and over and you never know you know it again every thousand dollars you don't borrow it's probably like two thousand or twenty five hundred dollars you don't have to pay back mm, no definitely and even like the ones that it's just five hundred dollars you know but it only took you like an hour two hours to do you just gotta pay 250 an hour so you know it's not not bad <laughs> so thank you for that uh Jorge. and even though i'm on the east coast i do have the list so I, i've gotten it um so i appreciate that for sure. Um, really quickly, before we move on from scholarships, I do want to talk about, and I'll stay, stay with you um, to start, something that I had no idea was a thing until after um, I started law school, and that's really the scholarship reconsideration request. Some people call it negotiation. I'm not a fan of the term. It's more of a reconsideration or an appeal. Um, how does that work? Does every school offer it? How do you deal with that? Because at least here at Duke, you know, those letters go straight to our Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid. So I'm assuming it's probably similar to you that they're going to end up in front of you and you make that decision. Um, how does it work for you? Sure. So, uh, you know, that there are some programs and not, there's not many of them who actually have a structured uh, matching program. Right. Um, I, I believe uh, Berkeley has one where they actually, you you complete a form, you know, you're, it's, it's a form where you, you submit, uh, you'll answer the, the questionnaire, you submit the scholarship that you are considering, and then they will determine whether they can match it or not, right? The, uh, but again, there's very few of those. Many of us will reconsider an offer, and, and that will be based on uh, what, you know, how strong is your application, have there any had there been any changes in your application since you were admitted? So, for example, maybe you retook the LSAT and you went, you know, you you jumped five points. Then, you know, that may warrant a reconsideration because now you're you may be paired up with other people who have stronger applications. If you just are looking, you know, if if cost is going to be a driver for you, which for many of us it is, right? It it's uh, you you have a scholarship from a, a school here, and then a very close scholarship or, or similar scholarship from another school, and you just really want to try and minimize that debt. You approach the school first and ask, you know, do you have? Would you be open to reconsidering my offer? Uh, in a very respectful way, you're asking them to reconsider it. They will either say yes, or unfortunately, this is what we can extend. If they say yes, then you will generally state why, you know, and, and again, the cost is going to be the driver, right? Why is it that you really want to go to that school, but but the cost is being, it's cost prohibitive to you? And you would submit a short statement as to why uh, you feel that you may be able to get a little bit more and why what's dry what's leading you to apply to that school you know you don't want to make it a practice of just like spray uh request everywhere right it, it's just or to use that as a leverage to try and get somebody else to give you that that's like the worst thing you could ever do because it's a small community we may find out and then you know you're going to be on the wrong end of that stick so um 
you know, what, what I do when I get a request is I will, uh, usually what I want to know is I, I want a copy of the other school that, you know, the request of the other school that, that you're considering. Uh, one, for me, it's because I want to see if it's a direct competitor, am I, am I under awarding to stay competitive? Because if, you know, I ultimately want to want to enroll my entering class. So I want to know what the other school may be doing that if, if they're out uh, scholarship being students, uh, from what I'm doing, I, I need to go to the dean and get more money so I can like be competitive. Uh, secondly, in many cases, the student doesn't really understand the scholarship. You know, again, we're going back to the uh, the conditional scholarships, right? Maybe the scholarship that they're uh, um, leveraging is uh, well, you need to be in the top one percent to get it renewed again for the following year. Whereas me, you know, maybe I only need you to be in the ha top half. Th there's a difference there. The dollar amounts may be the same, but the chances of you getting one renewed over the other is different. And and what it allows me to do is to like explain this to the student. Um, and I will then go back. And the other thing is that many of us don't have a rubric by which we award scholarships. You know, we're awarding scholarships. If the applicant is a very interesting applicant, I may award them a little bit more. Uh, if um, sometimes I'm reading applications at midnight, you know, and maybe I'm tired and I just don't award as much as I would have had I been bright eyed and, and full of coffee on the following day. And, you know, what I'll do is I will go back and look at look over the application. Did I miss anything in this application that tells me that they should get a little bit more? I will then go look at people that look similar to them in terms of the application and see if I'm on par. Am I awarding everybody evenly? And it could be a correction that I'm making on my end. So, I, again, there's tact in this process. You have to be humble. You can't just go and demand or threaten that you're going to withdraw your application if they don't give you money. Because, uh, you know, I, I think I may speak for the three of us. You're not going to want that person. You know, if that's if that's how they're starting out, you have three years with this student. You know, that's not that may not be the one student that you want around your halls. Mm -hmm. So so you have to, you know, you have to be you have tact, uh, be diplomatic about this and and follow their procedures. Yeah, I, can I just add the perspective? Of, uh, so I'm a school that uh, I'm a school that does not do reconsideration of merit scholarship at all. So um, you, you're welcome to send me an email, and if it's light and professional, I'm happy to have a dialogue with you about the way in which I uh, would evaluate your choices and um, you know the approach that I would suggest you take as you evaluate the offer that we've made you. But the answer in terms of being able to change the merit scholarship is going to be no. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for why we changed. We used to negotiate in a similar way to what Jorge described, which is where I would sort of individually take requests and kind of look at things. And if it was someone that really wanted to come and I really wanted them and try to make it work for a little bit more. Um, and there are two, one of the biggest reasons is that um, it made it made it very difficult to maintain a student aid budget um, in a predictable way. And um, as a public law school, without a like huge endowment from which to draw our scholarship dollars, it is really important that the budget that is set for me at the beginning of the cycle is the one that I end up with when the class comes in. And um, negotiation just added a lot of kind of variables into that process and unpredictability um, that in a process that already has unpredictability, right? right? Like I make an, like I make my best educated, um, you know, essentially guess, right? At how many scholarships to offer, how much to offer to how many students, how many to admit. Like I'm already inject, there's already a lot of uncertainty in our process. And so it just was like a fiscal necessity, right? For me to kind of have some way to have better control over it. So that's one reason. And there are other schools that are like that too. And so they may have, you know, they may grant far less reconsiderations or they may not take any at all, right? Um, for a similar reason. The other reason that is sort of um, challenging for me as a first gen uh, student is that, um, you know, as a, I was a first gen grad and I have a really hard time with this, which is that um, it's not always comfortable for everybody to engage in the process of asking for a school to renegotiate an award, either because you don't know you can do it, you don't know how to do it, um, you're intimidated by, you know, dealing with a bunch of different schools, 
Um, it just feels uncomfortable to talk about money. Um, I know that was a big one for me. Um, and so what I saw happening is that I would say more of the requests that I started to receive than, than not were from people who were, um, they didn't really need more money, if you know what I mean. Like everybody needs more money because law school is an expensive investment. But comparatively speaking, these were not the people that, you know, qualified for need-based aid or, you know, were, they had family support maybe kind of things like that, but they just came from a background and from and, and sort of culturally felt a bit more empowered to advocate for themselves than say students who maybe didn't. And so I just started to feel a little bit uncomfortable with that dynamic. Um, and so for me, um, even though it's hard sometimes to have students contact me who uh, really do need additional money, and uh, I really want them to come here and someplace else it, that's very good is offering them a more generous award. And I would love to be able to be more competitive on that piece. Um, and it killed me to have to say no. Um, I, I Overall, that is probably more the exception than the rule to most of the requests that I, I was getting and, and continue to get. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to kind of touch on, because this is something that I deal with in my um, process, which is because we have a separate need-based um, grant process, awarding process, um, I would, all, I, I do find it um, troubling, maybe is maybe an extreme word, but um, try to think of a diplomatic word. Um, uh, when a student emails me who um, has not gone through the need-based application process and is claiming a lot of need and hard financial hardship. And I look at their record and I can see they haven't submitted the FAFSA. They, so we didn't, and we, we have a process where we tell you that multiple times if we haven't gotten it and you want, you know, when you give you your scholarship, say, Hey, you might be eligible for more if you do the need application and, you know, and you still don't do it. And then you ask me and you tell me it's because you really need the money, right? Like, well, I, you know, so I would say if you approach a school, please be sure that you exhausted all of the processes that they have for giving out money, um, because that they, they probably thought, as we do, <laughs> a lot about the fact that they have separate processes and that there is this pool of money that's reserved for people who have need and they're trying to be supportive of that. But they're asking you to do this, you know, to take a step, like submit a FAFSA or whatever it might be. So um, that's kind of what I, I just wanted to chime in on the negotiation. Yeah. I I, th I think that the, the takeaway is that not everybody, not all schools operate the same way. Mm -hmm. And and Kristen is not evil for not considering them. There are fairly <laughs> valid reasons why she's doing it, you know, and, and the, the prime example is that they do have another process for you to ask to get money uh, through their, their uh, need-based operation. So it's not that she is, you know, not you know, not consider it. It's just that there's, there are other avenues. Yeah. So just make sure that you, um, you know, find out uh, by asking questions. There's nothing wrong with asking a question. Yeah, yeah no, definitely. And I can't emphasize enough what you said earlier, Jorge, you know, be mindful of how you're asking for money because that can decide the decision right there. You know, if someone is very humble about it or cordial about it and versus someone that's just like you know this is what i'm these other schools are offering me what are you going to do i'm like nothing I'm like enjoy those other schools you know if that's it because <laughs> you know it's, it's all about just being respectful um because you are trying to enter a profession and so you have to be professional um yeah the other thing was you know you said Kristen, yeah i was just happy to get money uh as a first year college student i was just i didn't realize i was like i could have asked for more because all my other classmates were talking about how they asked for more um and i didn't know that was a thing and then i tell people like it is an option for us here dude um, you know, we, it is not a super formal process. It's just more like email our financial aid department, you know, include one or two competing offers when you'll need all 10 that you may have. Um, and then we'll submit the reconsideration request. What we don't do is the, this back and forth, especially if we already increased your scholarship and then you're, you take it somewhere else and then you try to get more, we're not going to do that. And so that's something that you have to be very strategic of when you decide it and how many times you choose to do it. Some schools like the school I used to work at, they are. They actually had a limit. So we said, you can only submit this request once. And so if you submit it and you submitted two competing offers and then the next week you got a better one, you couldn't now come back. Well, like, oh, let me add this one. That was it. So you had to be extra careful and strategic of when you submitted that request. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, I tell students, you know, you want to do it a little bit later. You don't want to do it right away so that you can make sure that you have make a more fully informed decision. You have other all of your offers or almost all of your offers 
when you make that decision. But yeah, so moving on kind of where I, you know, I have my financial aid package, I know what this is going to look like. How do I, you know, we, we discussed it in a separate video, kind of like how do you factor this financial piece on where do I choose to go to law school? Um, but do you all have any general advice or tips um, now that I have all this information, how should I go about making that decision of where to attend law school? Um, I, I would just recommend that you use this as one of the fact of the many factors in, in the process of selecting a school. You know, I, I think that not counting the cost is a possible mistake, but also making a decision exclusively on cost is it can be a, a, a mistake because you can end up in a school that you're just very uncomfortable in and you're not going to succeed. I think that I always tell people, you know, you should like have a spreadsheet just like open up a spreadsheet, put the factors that you feel are important to you, and then sort of keep track of those, right? You know, definitely location uh, should be a factor. You know, if you're somebody that is from, you know, uh, East LA and you're considering Iowa, it may not be the best fit for you. You know, it may, but it may not. Uh, you, you want to definitely look for a place, uh, uh, a law school that's going to teach you the area of law that you're interested in. You know, if you're interested in immigration law and you pick a school based on other factors that has zero classes in immigration law, then what's the point of this? Uh, and also clearly uh, the cost, you know, the cost has to be a factor, but, you know, you know, determine what your cost is after you figure out how those funds are gonna be coming in. Are they mostly scholarship? Are they mostly loans? Um, and then keep track of that. And then, you know, based on the level of importance for each of those factors, you can then, you know, make, make, make the decision. You know, if at all possible, talk to people who are going there now, talk to people who went there and are now alums, and optimally you wanna visit, you know, if possible. Because there, that that is probably going to be the best way to determine to find out how how it feels to you. you know, are you comfortable from the point you walked in or not? Uh, and it may mean that you you love that place so much that you're willing to spend a little bit more. You're willing to borrow a little bit more, but you're going to end up in a place that that you're going to thrive. Uh, so that that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I would I would hundred percent echo that. And I think this is like this is a good time to kind of like think about the other video that talks about like, how do you pick a school once you have all your offers, right? Kind of, you need to combine these pieces. Um, the one thing I will say is that, um, and I share this with many admitted students who are sort of struggling when it comes down to like, I really want to come to your school, but this other school is offering me a little bit more, right? And they're also very good, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I think as prospective lawyers, and let's, let's admit it, probably a little bit type A, um, you know, we tend to sort of really lean hard into like our logic and our reason and what makes sense. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with when it comes time to make your final decision with going kind of with what your gut tells you, what feels like the right place. Um, because I think your gut is sort of informed by all the very sensible pieces of you. And sometimes you just need th that permission to kind of not have it be spelled out in black and white for you what you will do because it's very rarely the case that that ends up be, it ends up being that clear cut it's just that's not sort of the nature of most big decisions in life to be honest um and I think about so I always share my experience with this which is that you know I had sort of a school that I really wanted to go to that offered me a very very modest scholarship and another school that was also very very good but um and was offering me a very much more generous scholarship package but when I went there I kind of walked around and I just did not feel comfortable I I it was hard for me to articulate because it had the resources and the you know was going to give me the reach in terms of employment and all those things and it was less money it was going to be a lot less money but at the end of the day I just didn't feel right there and so I went to the school that required a larger investment from me um you know and uh I don't regret it almost 20 years later um, at all, even though, you know, it took me a long time to repay my student loans and all those pieces, like it was the right place for me. Um, and I'm glad that I kind of 
rejected sort of the logical part of me that was screaming to make a decision that just didn't feel right. And so I think give yourself, you know, some permission to maybe have that be the tiebreaker way, or, you know, if you're really struggling at the end of the day, let sort of what feels like the right place for you. Um, and the last thing I will say, which is what I say to all, especially students who come from like a low income background, and this, this kind of financial investment is just unheard of in your family and your family is definitely having a hard time understanding why you would take on this kind of indebtedness and why you would pursue something that's in this dollar amount um, is to say that, you know, if at the end of the day, you, you are the, the stress and sort of the discomfort with borrowing is going to always be sort of right there in the back of your mind on a, you know, maybe not a daily basis, but almost, um, then maybe for you that then cost does have to be sort of a bigger decision making factor because the one thing you don't want to have is you don't want to go through law school with your mind kind of fixated on something other than law school <laughs> uh, it really requires your full head and heart and if you have a big part of you that's sort of like stressing about this money that you're accruing and this interest that it's accruing and, and you're worried about the indebtedness and all those pieces you're not going to do your best you're not going to enjoy law school you're not going to you know perform well all of those pieces so it's I mean if you know that that's something that you can't you just can't quite get past okay if it's your family who can't get quite past it hey guess what this is your investment it is the time when you have permission to be a little selfish because the benefits you will incur in the long run and your family will incur in the long run are just they're 100 percent worth it so you know, be be mindful of that, whether it's your hesitation or your discomfort or everybody else's. Um, and, you know, be be making a decision that's about your future um, and knowing that, hey, everybody doesn't have to always agree with everything you decide to do, right? It's hard, I know, but uh, yeah, you know, you could be a little selfish sometimes, it's okay. <laughs> now, especially for this, this is what I tell my students about that. That's a conversation I have to have with my parents because you know, at the end of the day, you're the one that's going to deal with all the stress, the, the loans and everything. So you got to make sure that you're happy. So I'm glad that you guys brought that up, too, because that sometimes I think students forget, like, are you actually going to enjoy this place that you're going to be living in for three years? Because regardless of where you go, luck is going to be stressful. You don't want to be stressed and hate the place that you live in, too. And so, um, like I said, as I'm from East L.A., that took out the Midwest and the Northeast for me because I'm not a cold weather person um you know so that that made the application process a lot easier for me um but i want to conclude you know talking about first gen students uh with it just any kind of general advice that you all have because oftentimes at least for me this was the first time i was living on my own i wasn't on campus you know i had to manage my own money do you all have any general advice for how to budget as a law student um especially since you're trying to limit how much you want to borrow um for the most part so Kristen and Jorge, who would like to start? You want to go first, Kristen? Um, sure. I so I am not. Uh, I will admit, even now at forty-five, um, I am not a budget person. Like, like that's just not my thing. I don't know. I can kind of make one, but I don't really know how you implement it. So, the strategies that work better for me when I'm trying to be mindful of spending and what I wish I would have done more of in law school was um, kind of this really pushing myself on the delayed gratification piece. So like when I wanted to do something, you know, that required money or buy something or like get a new outfit or whatever it was, like part of my brain would always say, well, it's on sale or you're going to like share an appetizer. Or, you know, like I would find some part of my brain to intellectualize and rationalize it. But at the end of the day, the thing that I would try to always remember was my dad saying, in addition to saying, remember you're a poor, poor student, which is number one piece of advice for me to control my spending. But it was also to say like, okay, something might be a great deal. It might be a sale, but it's not free, right? And so it still costs you money. And so do you need to spend this money right now? Like, do you actually need this or do you just want it, right? Um, and uh, our financial aid director always does this thing where he talks about like, um, you know, Amazon being the downfall of many a current law student because it's so easy to buy stuff and like get it the next day or the same day. And it's very tempting. But Amazon also has this great feature where if you put something in your cart, you can leave it there and it will stay there and you could come back the next day. And if you really, you know, decide if you really need it. So, I mean, I think you really have to understand that this is a period of time where your goal should be 
really just kind of spending on your needs and an occasional want. And uh, it's only a three year period where you need to kind of really be very strict with yourself. And then I think it's also just like, you know, kind of that that thing of like always asking yourself, like, mm, could I wait till tomorrow to decide to buy this or do this or spend this money, right? Because chances are then 24 hours later, you might be like, yeah, I kind of thought of all the reasons why I shouldn't do this. Um, and it's a lot easier to say no then, right? Um, so I think if you can sort of, infor you know, sort of enforce a rule with yourself of that delayed, you know, forced delayed gratification, um, you're not saying no, you're saying no right now. Um, but that can be helpful. Um, and that's kind of what I try to do now. A lot of times I have to leave stuff in the Amazon card overnight to make sure that I really want to spend the money on it. Um, and it, cause it'll add up. It just does. It just adds up and you can't believe how quickly you go through that refund check. Um, when you don't sort of enforce some sort of discipline for yourself, <laughs> Uh, and, and it's just bad to be like, I'm out of money and the next refund doesn't check, doesn't come for a month or to have to be like, I can't pay my rent or, you know, you just don't want to add those stressors. So figure out a way, you know, some tool to force yourself to be um, evaluating that need want thing all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to find the way that works best for for you, right? I. I went to business school, so to me, everything's a spreadsheet. Uh, you know, it, you can you can take it back to what people did in the 1940s. Actually, my wife did this uh, when she was in, in school. She got her her uh, check, her financial aid check. She cashed it, went and bought envelopes, and broke it into a monthly amount. Divvied up everything over nine months, and I mean that is like our archaic way of doing it, but it worked for her, right? She never dipped into the next envelope until the next month came along. You can practically do the same thing with a spreadsheet. You know, you take your money, figure out how many months, divvy everything up over nine months. And that way you stay within your monthly budget. You know, there may be some times where, you know, I don't know, your car needs a service and you may have to borrow from the next month to cover that, uh, that expense. But it's critical that you just don't blow through the money and end up short at any one point because uh Kristen's right you know the stressors that come with the financial piece um uh, can can just like ruin your experience uh the other thing is you know remember that whatever you borrow it doesn't mean that you have to keep borrowing the same amount right so if you borrow and like for whatever reason you're you're ending up with excess money every month you can always go back and either return money loan money or reduce the next uh, payment. So, uh, you know, monitor that, uh, you know, if you want to live by the beach alone, that's going to cost you a lot more than if you have a roommate and then you, you know, live in like the most modest place uh, in a smaller apartment. Um, and, and there may be some give and take in those areas. The other thing is that keep in mind that, you know, the cost of attendance, it's a very basic budget. It is not intended for you to make car payments. It doesn't account for the fact that, you know, maybe your brother needs money and he's hitting you up for money. It, that's not the purpose of this. It is to cover your direct educational expenses. And I know that, you know, at least in, you know, as a Latino, uh, sometimes you just want to go help your parents, right? And that's, I understand that. But just keep in mind that, that's just not the purpose of the money that you're being given. It's to cover your 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 law school expenses, and it's not doesn't account for any other expense outside of that. So, um, you know, you just need to stay focused and make sure that you are not uh, that you're you're using those loans in in this case to to cover the costs that are directly um, uh, impacting your ability to succeed in law school. Uh, so whether it's a spreadsheet, whether it's envelopes, whether it's just, you know, uh, leaving stuff on the uh, Amazon basket and not buying it, uh, whatever works for you, you want to live very modest. So that way, by the time you graduate, you don't have debt that looking back, you didn't have to borrow. Yeah, 
No, yeah, no. you do not have to borrow the max. We will offer you the maximum amount you can by the cost of tens. You don't have to take it all. Yeah. You would just take what you need and then take out more later. <laughs> There's lots of other tricks you can do to kind of help pace yourself a little bit. Well, that, yeah. yeah. And you also want to leave some for, just in case an emergency, like for me, my first semester of law school, halfway through, my laptop died. That was it. And I was like, well, I need a new laptop. Um, And so that was not money that I didn't have. But fortunately... I had some left over from what I had borrowed. So that's what I use, you know. Um, but yeah, obviously don't buy a new car with that money because <laughs> then you're paying double interest for it. And, you know, for me, law school was the first time that I fully understood the saying that many of our parents say of I comida na casa because it's a lot cheaper to just buy your own groceries and make that food than to go out to eat. So that's an easy way to cut costs too. So with that, thank you, both of you, uh, for your time, um, for all of your advice. I know it's very appreciated by our students. I learned a lot, too. So thank you for that. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all later on in the room. So thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye.